Hi, welcome to another video by Fortune Buchholz of fortunesfool.com. As promised, I'm going to continue in the reading series for Chiro Marchetti's new Fantasy Echo Kipper by reading The Square of Nine. And I'm going to follow the same procedure that I did in the last video, the line of five. So if you haven't seen that, look back in my playlist and make sure that you watch that because reading skills, of course, are sequential. So the skills and ideas that you see displayed in the line of five reading will be used again and built upon here in the square of nine. The square of nine itself, of course, is an important stepping sto stone to the entire grand tableau, the layout that uses the entire deck. So I really encourage you to follow along. Get out your own cards if you have them to match the layout. Take your own notes. You know, study the layout after the video is over. Try a couple of samples of your own using the technique and take a lot of notes because that's really just the best way to learn. So um, I really encourage everyone uh, to do that and that's the way that I teach my live classes as everyone uh, here who comes to my live classes can tell you. So uh, that said, uh, I would just like to take a moment and thank everyone for their continued support. I'm very grateful for the gracious and very kind words that so many people have offered me, not only for Chiro's fantastic deck, uh, but also for my writing, my videos, and of course those of my beautiful co-authors, such talented people, especially the wonderful Suzanne Zitzel. Uh, I'm just really um, gratified and I feel uh, just a lot of support and warmth from our friends in the card community and that's just priceless to me. So again, thank you. Thank you all so much for that. Now let's go ahead and talk about the mechanics of the square of nine. So of course, uh, as in all card questions, you need a firm question. The square of nine is really best, I think, in my personal opinion, for one question or one theme. Right? The grand tableau, you can do multiple questions or multiple themes, but the line of five and the square of nine are really, in my mind, best for one question or one theme. So um, let's just go ahead for a moment and talk about how we lay out. Again, this is another case where when uh, reading for uh, my co-sitters, right, reading for my co-listeners, the people who are working with me in an active listening session, um, I really want to focus on the significator and I do draw the significator for whatever the topic or theme of their question is deemed to be and put it right in the center. Again, this is not so much for me as so much it is for the sitter because it helps them focus on the storyline. It helps them focus on the fact that the reading is about them. It's about their question. It's about their key issue. Right? It's easy uh, in a larger reading to get lost in all of the storylines and get lost in all the combinations. So I like to have a, for them a visual reminder of what really the core issue is and should stay as we focus on that throughout the reading and the session. So again, that's another um, reason why I just always like to use a significator. Uh, for these lines of fives and these squares of nines, again, uh, as acts of concentration or points of concentration to make sure that we don't lose our focus as we go through and never lose sight of the question, right? That's so key, always to address the sitter's question and always to look at the cards from the perspective that uh, the sitter has and the sitter needs. Right. Okay, and of course the sitter will tell you that because they know their own life best, they know their own issues best. We're not here to tell them how to live, we're not here to fix them or solve their problems. We're just here to help them in a neutral space as they work through and solve their own problems by uh, talking to their own inner wisdom and really laying that out for themselves, right, through discussion and conversation. So um, that's how we do that and let's just go ahead and go forward with how we read the cards. So when we have Chiro's deck here, here's a, one of the beautiful cards, the drawing room as I often call it, though he calls it the family room, and it's traditionally translated as the living room, but you know, uh, I think drawing room is really the best actual English translation for this, but you know, so we go. Um, I like to put the significator in the middle, and then I lay out three cards on the top, one card to the side, and three cards on the bottom. So I will lay them out, you know, essentially, right, um, as card five is the center, card one, card two, card three, card four. Card five has already been laid down. That's the center card. This is the significator card. Card six, and then card seven, card eight, and card nine. So uh, I like to follow a very 
a similar and traditional procedure. When reading the square of nine, right, I will pair the corners diagonally, right, one and nine, three and six, right, I'm sorry, three and seven, and then I will go ahead and I will um, get that as the central message, then I will read the diamond in pairs around the significator, right, to get more detail. I will tend to read the columns as the past, the present, and um, a possible uh, outcome that would be logical from the other two columns. And then if people want to look at options, I tend to look at the rows, rows 1 and row 2, or row A and row B, and row C as different options. Sometimes you'll see uh, when you're reading the square of nine, depending on the nature of the question, that the bottom row, row C, can sometimes end up being um, potential obstacles or things that they have not been thinking about, right? that have not come to their attention that they may be overlooking. So that is something that will occur to you based on the reading, and that's something that will reveal itself in real time as you're there. So, you know, it may not happen like that, or it, it may happen like that. You just may have to kind of look at the cards with the sitter and talk about them and see how, you know, how that meaning emerges in the relationship, as I, as I like to say. So with that said, I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, cut ahead to the voiceover portion. I'm just going to, as I said, lay the cards out statically, put that static picture up, and then just go through and describe the reading as I did with my line of five. So uh, get ready for that, and thank you again so much for your time and attention. I'm really very grateful, and I'll see you in just a moment on the other side in the static voiceover. Thanks so much, and have a great day. Hi. So uh, here it is, we're in the static um, overview portion of the Square of Nine video, and I just wanted to uh, go ahead and get started here. We'll just leap right into the cards. So as you can see in the static picture before you, um, we have the Square of Nine all laid out. Let me just uh, take a moment and uh, go through the cards and go through the layout very quickly and state where they are in the layout and then I'll go ahead and give the background and the question for the sitter who is a male asking about a business project. So let's just go ahead and, and uh, I'll mention the cards for those of you who want to lay your own cards out and follow along at home with your notebook as I suggest. Alright so the card in the first position on the upper left is a card uh, unique to Chiro's deck. It's a quote-unquote extra card and I've already talked about all his extra cards in my extra video which you can find in the playlist. So go ahead and check that out if you haven't seen that already. So this is card 39. This is card community. The card in position 2 in the center of the top row is expectation or waiting. Uh, card, the card in position number 3 or the far right of the top row is card 35, pathway or traditionally a long way. Then uh, let's go ahead to position 4 which is in the center row on the left side and that's card 29, imprisonment. Uh, which in traditionally is just called prison. So then, of course, in position five, we have the significator, the center card, the haupt person, the main male, as Chiro calls him, or as I like to say, the gentleman. And then uh, we have in position number six, on the far right of the center row, we have card 18, child. Uh, moving to position seven on the bottom row at the far left, we have message card number seven. That is, card seven is in the seventh position. That's interesting, but not particularly significant for me in this reading. And then uh, in the center of the bottom row, in position number eight, we have card 14, which Chiro calls message of concern and which is traditionally called sad news. Then uh, we have in position nine, card 10, which means journey, right? Card 10, journey, and that's the same as in the traditional deck. So there we are, that's our basic layout, and I'm gonna go ahead and talk about the background and all of that while um, you guys get your cards and lay them out if you are, as I said, following along. 
All right, so the sitter is a male. This is actually his first card reading. He uh, himself is very skeptical about cards, and he came only at the urging of his girlfriend. So uh, why did she urge him to come? They'd been having a lot of difficulties at home based on his unhappiness, stress, and anxiety. And, of course, he was not really feeling that it was the kind of matter he wanted to go see a licensed therapist for. Although, of course, if he had wanted to, or had I felt that he needed to, ethical concerns uh, would have um, dictated that I, of course, immediately you refer him. And I, like most other readers, have a set of business cards uh, so that one can make proper professional referrals if people request them, or if it turns out, you know, that you feel, I feel strongly that people need them. Uh, but this was just kind of a, a state where he was exploring, talking about his issues. Uh, he was not the kind of person who talked readily about his feelings or his issues. And uh, he really came only because his girlfriend really pressed him for that and also because his, as I said, stress and anxiety was beginning to cause them a lot of problems in their relationship. So he was willing, although quite reluctantly and mostly just to please her, you know, he was willing to, to give cards a try. So we went ahead and, and there we are. So uh, he, again, to disguise the details for ethical concerns and to preserve all kinds of confidentiality, as I usually do, um, it, you know, he was a working guy who was concerned about his new business project. He wasn't particular happy in his current job where he felt stifled. And he was eager to push his own project. Uh, he was in the technology industry. He wanted to start his own startup or begin to work on his own prototype. And he had, in fact, begun even to think about writing a business plan or maybe making a pitch deck. But he hadn't really gone uh, too much farther than that. Uh, so his question specifically is, you know, what does he need to know about the prospects for success in his business plan or in his proposed business. So uh, that's kind of where we started, and that's the question as we formulated it. So uh, let's go ahead then and start with the mechanics of reading the square of nine. As I said before, what we're going to do first thing is we're going to pair the corners, that is position one and position nine. So we're going to pair card 39, community, with card 10 journey. And so then I asked him if he was thinking about taking a business trip to a business conference or some other kind of business meeting. And in fact, uh, he said that he had been thinking about going uh, to a very large, popular, and well-known conference that incorporates music and technology, and that he was hoping there to make some contacts and attend some of the side parties, which often uh, give one an ability uh, to pitch uh, or, you know, to pitch one's options to pitch one's business plan and also, of course, to learn how to do that, to meet other people who could be useful. Um, I think it's interesting that I find the square of nine often deals with a time period of two to four months, and this very famous uh, music and technology festival would, in fact, be pretty much within a time span of four months. So um, I thought that was uh, uh, just very interesting, and I thought it was something that helped frame the discussion in terms of the time frame around when these activities could benefit him the most, which meant that he shouldn't really delay, he should really kind of get started. All right, so that said, then let's go ahead and pair uh, position number three, which is pathway, card 35, with position seven, which is card seven, message, right? So uh, I asked him if he had really thought about the journey to writing this business plan, right, or making this pitch deck. Uh, and he, of course, had not really sat down and gone through what it takes to do that. You know, like many people, it was sort of a dream for him, and he had kind of gotten started, you know, making some notes, but he hadn't really sat down and written down all of the things that he needed to do in order to actually, you know, successfully write a business plan and to complete a pitch deck. Um, so we talked about various books and activities that he could perform. I asked him if he was willing to make such a list and to actually organize 
you know, uh, his thoughts and to actually take his own desire with the seriousness required to make a real preparation and not just to, you know, think about it or make some haphazard, you know, slapdash attempts, but to really be, be rigorous and methodical about it. And so he agreed that was something that he would like to do. Uh, in fact, uh, due to his position and, you know, work in the technology industry, he was usually a very detail-oriented and methodical person. So he was kind of surprised, in fact, that he had not, you know, really been able to focus and, you know, get this plan laid out and really, you know, nail down all of the aspects of what he had to do to write a business plan and then to turn that kind of business plan into a pitch deck. Um, so that's an interesting uh, point, and we, you know, kind of wanted to to sort of explore that, but that would have been a longer reading, so we didn't actually, you know, sort of get into those details at this time, but I just thought it was something for him to think about as to what was keeping him from following his normal course, which would have been to be very rigorous and very detail-oriented about it, and why he was taking this approach, you know, this sort of half-hearted, unfocused approach, which apparently is so much like him. And he related that back to the cards that we see in the first column, which I'd like to talk to you about now. So the cards in the first column are the cards that I normally associate with the past. And when I say first column, I mean the left-hand column, which, as I said, are often the cause or the past. We see here in, in this column card 39, which is in position 1, card 29, imprisonment, which is uh, in position 4, and then again in position 7, we go back to message. So... I asked him if he was, in fact, unhappy and did he feel stifled in his current uh, job. And yes, he repeated that he did. He did feel like uh, the company he was working for wasn't going in the right way. And he had actually written an email to his supervisor talking about the project that they were working on, the product they were working on, and how they were not really uh, using the technology to the the best of it, their ability and how they had really didn't have quite the right technology for it. And he was really wanting to get his supervisor to hear that there should be some adjustments made to the way they were working on that project and what, what platforms and so forth they were using to make that project in order to you know, make it more successful, make it more efficient. And he just didn't feel like they had chosen the right technology framework and that it would be important to make the change now before they continued any further development. You know, he really thought that that was very important to him, so he had uh, written that email. Um, but even after he had done that, he didn't feel anxious about that because apparently his supervisor, you know, welcomed that kind of input from the employees. He realized that, you know, even if he had changed the, the framework in the platform they were using in the way that, uh, you know, he thought was best, it, it really still wouldn't fulfill his desire, which is to stop working for someone else and to, you know, work on his own projects and be in charge of his own, you know, prototype and his own company. And he really realized that he had that desire, but, but he, of course, you know, to leave your job and to leave your company where you've worked for a long time it is a difficult thing to do, particularly if you are a technologist, you may not have a lot of business experience, you may not know, you know, how to raise money, you may not be the best public speaker when it comes to the pitching, you may not be sure you have the skills to write the business plan. So there's a lot of anxiety and uncertainty, you know, in that prospect, even if you really want it. And that's clearly, you know, what was bothering him and was causing a lot of trouble, you know, in his relationship as he dealt with his own you know, angst around that. And of course, it's natural. It's a huge change. Any person, you know, embarking on such a situation uh, could feel the same way. And, um, you know, it's something that takes a lot of confidence, a lot of experience, and a lot of support and or, you know, training. So if you don't have that, it, it could be really kind of scary and, and cause you, you know, some difficulties. So that's kind of where he felt that was kind of coming from. Uh, and he felt that was a very beneficial realization to understand that his anxiety 
about his job and about his future prospects and his really inability to reach into himself and uh, you know, fulfill his own goals, fulfill his dream, his concern that, you know, he was kind of, quote unquote, an imposter and didn't have the ability to actually make this pitch and business plan happen. These were all the things that were sort of roiled within him. And he felt these were breaking out and causing his kind of relationship issues. So, you know, I, we talked about that uh, for a long time, and I asked him a lot of, of open-ended questions about that. Uh, and so that he could admit that and talk about that, you know, openly articulate that out loud to himself was really a, a big deal for him because, as I said, this really wasn't his personality type uh, to be very self-reflective. And so that was about as far as he could go before he began to feel uncomfortable. So we sort of stopped that line right there. And then we went forward with the rest of the reading because, you know, the goal is not to freak him out. The goal is to help him find ways that he can, you know, and is willing to move forward and, you know, take action. So then uh, let's go ahead and read the diamond around him to get some more detail, right? So um, if we look at the diamond around him, we can see that the card in position two is card 28, expectation. And then we move to position four, right, which is uh, card 29, imprisonment. Then we go down. Uh, to, you know, card eight, which is sad news, card 14. And then we go down to, uh, we go up again, excuse me, uh, to the third column, right, to position six, where we see card 18, child. And then we complete the diamond uh, by going back up to position two, which again is expectation. So this led me to ask him some questions about um, what he was waiting for, you know, so um, he, he, feels, he feels stifled. He says that he feels, you know, alone and somewhat unsupported uh, currently where he's working. And he has been sort of feeling that way for a while, for several months. Uh, the card expectation is often called, you know, sort of three months wait. And so he had been, you know, feeling this way for, as he said, about three or four months, several months, and, um, you know, it had really, uh, it had really been demoralizing for him. So then we go ahead and we go to the next uh, side of the diamond, so to speak, uh, which is card 29 with card 14. And I asked him what he would do if his supervisor did not respond appropriately, or as he felt appropriately, to his uh, email that he had written about changing the platform or framework. Uh, you know, what would he do if he got, you know, unhappy or unwelcome news? If the supervisor said, you know, we just can't do that or we're unwilling to do that, right? Because that was very much a possibility, you know, and he hadn't really kind of thought about that. He had sort of, you know, stated his piece and he knew his supervisor would be open to feedback. But I asked him really what he would do should he get a response that, you know, was not his way, right? And so, you know, he talked about how that was a possibility, he supposed, um, and how that would, you know, further cement his desire to actually move on, to go someplace new, and to do his own thing. And you can kind of see that in the third leg of the diamond, which is, uh, card 14, sad news, and card 18, child, right? So I said, you know, maybe you should consider the concept that you won't get your way here, that the company is going in a different direction, and you're really, you know, set on your own path, and you should, you know, if this comes out, you could really strike out, and this would be what you really want to do, right? So he agreed that that was, in fact, what uh, he would do, and he thought about various uh, plans that he would have to make in order to be able to leave the company successfully for himself and what he would have to do in order to be able to get ready to branch out on his own, you know, overall and how that would affect his relationship uh, with his girlfriend, you know. So he, he talked a little bit about that. Uh, and then we moved on to the last leg of the diamond, which is, of course, card 18, child, 
back to the expectation card 28. So I said once he started on something new, you know, how long did he think he would have to get something together, to get a business plan together, to get his pitch deck together? And again, we come back to this kind of sense of, you know, three months or so is what he would need to, to invest in the research and the writing, and that this was a short time period, so he would have to really be focused, he'd really have to know what he was doing, he'd have to commit, and it would be, you know, a, a, a period of really... Uh, focused activity, a burst of activity, and he would have to, you know, really push through that time in order to, you know, get things done so that he could go to this festival that was happening in four months, as I said, right? So the question is, is does he have that drive to really work as hard as he can for three months in order to hammer out a pitch deck and to hammer out a business plan. And could he also do it alone? Would he need help, you know? If he feels like he is quote unquote an imposter, if he doesn't feel like he has the business skills or the presentation skills, where could he get the help and support that he would need to do that, right? And would he, would he get that at the conference or would he, you know, get that beforehand by working with other groups, you know, um, various groups or meetups for uh, potential entrepreneurs that are here locally. So he talked about his various options or ideas in terms of finding local groups who would support him in writing his business plan and improving his speaking so that he could, you know, actually go through and make those things a success and feel confident in in doing them because of course obviously you're not going to sell a pitch successfully you're not going to be able to complete your business plan if you don't have that you know self confidence you really have to have a very strong belief in yourself and in your plan if you're going to be able to pitch it successfully so we talked a lot about um, those concerns then let's go ahead and talk about the present you know and that is the middle column here right so the middle column Again, we go back to, to position two, card 28, expectation, himself as the center card in position five, and the card at the bottom, which was, you know, sad news, card 14, position eight. So I suggested to him that it's highly likely, right, that right now in his present situation, he may not get a positive answer. But since we had already talked about, you know, things that he could do or how he could handle getting a, a, a rejection, you know, on his plan to change frameworks and to change platforms, then, um, you know, would he be able to have a response, you know, how, how he would then begin to, you know, close out his project and begin to end his time at his current company is as he felt that he really, you know, just didn't want to stay because, as I said, he didn't like the direction that they were currently going. So he had to talk about that. He'd worked there for a couple of years, and he felt rather attached to his friends there, although, as I said, he didn't particularly agree with the management or the product direction. He still thought it was a good product, and he liked his friends there. So that's a question of, you know, sort of working through how he would sever that relationship in a professional and productive way and how he could preserve those contacts for the future because you never know, you know, in the technology business when you may meet people again or even whether if his idea was really great, if his current company would want to invest in it. I mean, you just never know these things. So uh, we talked about that for, you know, a long time. And then we talked uh, a bit about what could be possible, you know, outcomes for him. And for that, we looked at the third column right, which is position three, pathway, right, and then we have position six, which is child, and then we have, again, the ninth position, which is the card journey. So I asked him about how long he thought this process of getting his startup going, you know, would really take, and, and how long was he able to sustain the effort of, say, self-financing, bootstrapping, living comfortably without, you know, having his regular job, uh, you know, could he, how long could he sustain that? And it turned out that he had quite a lot of savings. He had more than a year's worth of savings. 
So that is, is cognizant and in accord uh, of the pathway card, right, which means a long way, a hard, a hard long road uphill, right, with light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. But he did have the, the financial wherewithal to last the long haul, if need be. And so he could really, you know, pour in some money into, you know, the future, into his new, his new project and his new uh, idea. So then I asked him uh, about the journey card, you know. Um, would he do it here where he is or would he d want to do it somewhere else, you know. What kind of trip was involved? What kind of travel was involved? And then he, he said to me that it was actually... His, his business idea was an app that had to do with improving um, travel bookings, right? So this is literally travel, you know, literally travel. That was his new business idea was literally travel. And you can also see that as well in the column, right? So it's the literal meaning of those three cards, right? He's, his new thing is literally about travels and journeys, you know, moving along a path, going from one place to another on a vacation, and also, you know, more abstractly about his own journey and his own, you know, efforts that could take him as much as a year or more than a year before he sees their full fruition. So um, that's kind of how we, you know, went in and talked about the square of nine. He felt much better afterwards. He felt like he had gained some clarity and some emotional stability here, though of course he would never have used uh, those words. We did talk very quickly about the, the two rows, the top two rows as options. So again, let's go back through and look at those uh, various options in the top two rows. So that would be cards one, or position cards one, two, and three, which are actually cards 39, community, uh, card 28, you know, uh, expectation, and card 35, a pathway. And so we kind of see that as, you know, um, what his, you know, first option would be, right, which is to just uh, stay at his company, even if he didn't like the direction, just wait, right, and then just follow this long, hard path and hope that it might get better at his current company. But that didn't really sit well with what he thought his inner desire was, which, as I said, was to strike out on his own. So then if we look at the, the second, you know, this kind of second option, you see him that he can, you know, uh, be stuck for a little bit, not get his way, you know, work hard where he is, right, and work on his business plan, because, uh, you know, the card imprisonment can also be an office, right? It's any kind of enclosed space. So it suggested to me that what he really needed to do was he really needed to get, uh, you know, into a co-working space, someplace crisp and official, where he would actually, you know, be forced to, to focus, right, on what he was doing, where he would be isolated, he would be away from the distractions of home and the tensions of his, you know, of his life with his girlfriend, away from his, you know, video games and the other things that distracted him. He would really go to a co-working space and focus there in his, you know, office and really work on his new thing. So um, that's kind of what we talked about, what, would, what it would mean if he would do A versus B, if he did row one versus row two. And uh, so he really, you know, felt like he had looked at his options and he did sort of commit to himself that he would go through and he would ab actually make a list, you know, make a lightweight kind of plan as to understanding, you know, the eight or ten things you have to do to get a reasonable business plan written and then to go through and look at how you turn that business plan into a pitch deck, which is a, a pretty well-known skill, but it does actually take time and effort and you have to actually lay out those steps and sort of give yourself kind of like little lightweight milestones and sort of, you know, very rough time frames and then commit to going forward with that. So uh, that was how the reading came out for him. And he felt surprised by how well this reading had uh, gone for him and how much help it had brought him. As I said, he was very skeptical initially about the benefits of cards. And 
And um, I think that he will do very well. And since he is a person who is innately detail-oriented and rather focused, that he will, in fact, be able to complete his own plans and be successful. So thanks so much for listening. I hope this square of nine uh, illuminated how one reads squares of nine. And uh, again, if you have any questions uh, about this square of nine, don't hesitate to contact me on my social media. Uh, and I will make another video in the next few days having to do with the overall grand tableau. So thanks so much. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen, and have a great day.